day one of the St. Lo Perrier's breakthrough. It was probably very boring for most of the men to sit quietly and wait for the attack to begin, especially since the jump-off dates were changed several times. All of the officers were very busy. We spent hours studying maps of our objectives. Aerial photos were very accurate. With the use of special angles in glass, the photos showed orchards so close we actually could count the trees. Some of the photos were only a few days old. I was impressed with all the information at our disposal. I hoped the Germans didn't know as much about us but felt they could not because of our air superiority. On July 25, 1944, the big attack finally got underway. The faraway drone of planes grew to a deep rumble as hundreds of huge bombers passed directly overhead, filling the sky. We were told there would be 3,000 bombers and 500 fighter bombers in the raid. Ours was a grandstand view just behind the front lines, and we watched in complete awe as wave after wave paraded over us. There seemed to be about 200 planes in each formation. What was splendidly inspiring for us must have been terrifying to the Germans. The earth beneath us shook as strings of bombs began to explode just to the front of our infantry lines. The rush of air from the blasts gave us a good push even though we were a half mile away. Our orders were to jump off and attack immediately after the bombing to take advantage of a stunned, confused enemy. Staggering misfortune stepped in, however, with a cruel blow. One whole wing of bombers miscalculated and dropped its entire load on the front lines of one of our divisions. The losses in dead and wounded were over 800, including the killing of Lieutenant General Leslie McNair, Army Ground Forces Commander. This tragedy and its confusion caused the postponement of the attack one more day. The Germans, meanwhile, used the respite to bring up reserves to fill in much of the area the bombs had knocked out. The enemy we faced thus were a mixed lot of survivors of the bombing, plus newly arrived paratroopers. My personal longest day began as we jumped off, my first attack, the next morning, July 26, 1944. As soon as we crossed the saint lo Perriers Road, just west of saint lo we came upon a dreadful sight. The destructive power of those thousands of 500-pound bombs overwhelmed the senses. The dead from both sides lay twisted and torn some half-buried by overturned earth. Bloated cows with stiff legs thrust skyward and death lay everywhere, as did burned-out vehicles and blasted equipment. I've never been able to erase it from my mind. When the order to move out had first come, my muscles had been taut with fear. After a while I realized that somehow my body was moving forward behind the tanks as my platoon took the lead. It seemed to me like the first few moments of a football game. As we advanced, I began to feel my mind and body working together again, still very scared but functioning. Our tank company was wonderfully aggressive, shooting up everything in sight. The tank commander's tactics were very sensible, it seemed to me. Since no Americans were ahead of him, his orders were to shoot and shoot. All that tank firepower blasting away kept the enemy pinned with his head down, unable to return fire, and allowed us to advance rapidly and capture many prisoners with very few losses. Hey. Many of the Germans were still in shock from the bombing, and many had no desire at all to fight. Actually, I don't understand how any of them even survived. Bomb craters big enough to swallow a jeep were so close together, in some areas it was difficult for our tank drivers to zigzag through. Once, as we rounded the hedgerow at the corner of a big meadow, one of our tanks accidentally ran over a dead cow. It was bloated, and when it burst, its entrails wound around the tank treads, and there was the terrible mouth-filling stench to add to the gore. It was too much for me. I fell down on my hands and knees and was retching miserably when the sudden roar of a diving plane made me look up, just as one of our P-47s let go two bombs directly above me. I dove down flat in my own vomit, needlessly, for the bomb sailed on another 200 yards ahead and knocked out a jerry-armored half-track I had not even known was there. A few minutes later, I lost my first man. He stood right up in an open spot and tried to match his rifle against an enemy half-track. They machine-gunned him down and fled. I shuddered at his futile death, for a rifle was not much use against steel plate, and letting yourself get caught in the open by a machine-gun is fatal. 
Better to take cover and fight again than to take foolhardy risks. If he'd armed himself with a rifle grenade or bazooka, it might have been a different story. I felt sick. Our first village, Stangil, now was close in front, and we approached with caution. It was just a small crossroads hamlet with about thirty buildings that seemed to go about a block in each direction from the one intersection. The buildings were close together, like stores, and built right up to the narrow street, with no sidewalk. The backyards were open country. My platoon swung to the right across the fields and came into the village from the right, or west end, and headed toward the central crossroads. My men and I were walking on either side of the road, following our lead tank into the little burg. As we approached, I was on the left beside a high stone wall, and the first buildings were just ahead, not over ten yards beyond the end of the wall. Suddenly a shell exploded inside the first building beyond the wall, and instantly I hit the dirt. When I looked up a few seconds later from my prone position in the brick gutter, a Jerry Mark IV medium tank was cutting around the corner only a short block away and heading directly toward me. Our Sherman tank and the Mark IV began to fire at each other at once from point-blank range. Our tank began to back up as it was firing, apparently looking for some kind of cover, and this left me in front, actually between the two tanks. I looked around frantically, but the stone wall appeared impossible to climb and the buildings ahead were too close to the oncoming Mark IV, so I stayed flat in the gutter and watched the tank battle. Each tank fired as rapidly as possible as the distance closed to less than 100 yards. The muzzle blasts shattered windows in the houses and storefronts, and each explosion knocked my helmet halfway off my head. The narrow, walled-in street seemed to act like a sound tunnel, and the concussion smashed at my ears. My wife tells me today, I'm somewhat hard of hearing, and I'm not very surprised. The Mark IV kept firing as it came toward us. Both tanks somehow kept missing at this close range, or their armor-piercing shells were bouncing off. Finally, after an exchange of about a half-dozen rounds each, the jerry suddenly went up in flames. Two krauts crawled out of the tank's belly escape hatch and ran back for the corner. Both were knocked down by machine gun fire from our tank. The German tank commander, a sergeant, then jumped down from the turret and charged right at me. I struggled to my feet but could not raise my ML rifle to my shoulder. As I shook with excitement and fright, my rifle came up to my waist and fired three times, and was empty. Had I been more experienced, I would have reloaded my rifle before walking into the berg with a clip of eight bullets. On the other hand, it was probably better for my peace of mind that I didn't have a full clip, for I probably would have killed him. After he had fallen, I did my best to reload, but was all thumbs. I just couldn't get that damn clip to fit into the breech. The Kraut sergeant had blood seeping from his ears and mouth due to the concussion of his tank being hit, and with his eyes staring directly into mine, he grabbed his thigh where my bullet had struck and then hobbled across the street into a doorway, all before I managed to get my rifle reloaded. Luckily, he never attempted to shoot me with the pistol he wore as a sidearm. He must have been in much greater shock than I, and had every right to be unable to function. We didn't pause to search the buildings, so I don't know how badly he was hurt. The shooting of my first man face to face was not covered by the infantry school back at Fort Benning, and I was deeply shaken. I'm glad I didn't kill him. The shock was bad enough. Going through the slam-bang tank duel beforehand hadn't helped. I was still trembling a few seconds later, and would have been unable even to defend myself. My first hour in combat had been enough for my lifetime, and I was wondering if I'd last the day. Because of the burning Mark IV in the middle of the street, another rifle company from our 2nd Battalion detoured around the buildings on our right. When this company came to the crossing road, they turned to their right and continued the attack toward Canacy, the artillery forward observer flying in a Piper Cub overhead mistook this company for Jerry's retreating out of town and called down a very heavy barrage of 105 Nin Mieter artillery on them. This blasting of our own men was stopped as soon as possible, but not in time to prevent many casualties. I'll never forget one G.I. lying in the road with a huge gash all the way through his shoulder, one leg badly mutilated near the ankle. A medic gave him a shot of morphine and slipped a cigarette into his mouth. The wounded man raised his good arm to us as we passed and yelled at us to go get the SOBs. Of course, he didn't know he was talking about our own artillery, 
Most of the time, our flying forward observers were great, but identification from a maneuvering plane can be tricky and mistakes resulted in a few tragedies. Our progress was good, and we had taken quite a few prisoners as we approached the next town, Canacy. It was getting along into the late afternoon of a long, long day, and we were near exhaustion when one of the commanding officers gave us a chance to rest. He called for fighter bombers to hit the town before we went in. We flopped down where we were in an apple orchard and sprawled out with our backs against a hedgerow, hoping we'd never again have to move. During this delicious respite, one of my sergeants had a premonition. He came to me and asked if I'd make sure his personal effects were sent home if he didn't make it. I tried to talk him out of his obvious depression, but got nowhere. A little while later, as we rested against the hedgerow facing the front, we heard one of our tanks making a big racket coming up to the hedgerow behind us. We got out of there fast, except for the sergeant. We yelled at him to get moving, but he just sat in a daze as the tank plowed through and buried him alive. A bunch of us dug him out at once, but it was too late. Thus my second man was gone, and he as needlessly as the first. I knew then I'd never survive if I let myself get tied in with every case. It was vital for me to build some sort of protective shield within myself and concentrate only on what had to be done in the present and how to do it. I forced myself to suppress all thoughts of prior losses and gruesome mental pictures of the tragedy of war. A little later, the fighter bombers hit Canacy, setting many fires and creating more rubble. We mounted our tanks and went on in. It was a bit larger than Saint-Gilles, up to maybe seven or eight hundred people. The drifting smoke screened the fires a little and made an eerie glow in the oncoming darkness. It was all very spooky, and it seemed my eyes couldn't travel fast enough to find signs of a hidden enemy who might be watching us as we rode through town on the backs of tanks. Fortunately, the Jerry's had pulled out, and so we pushed right on through Canacy and into the night. Now we were in even more of a no-man's land. The Germans were so unaware of our penetrations that in the darkness a German tank came up from the side and was moved right into our column by a smart MP, and then one of our tanks knocked him out from the rear. As the Nazi tank burned and its shells began to explode, we were forced to detour in the field around it. When we returned to the road, a German colonel drove up with a staff car and was immediately captured. At 2 hours a.m., we were still going strong and getting near our first day's objective, Le Mesnil Hermann. My platoon was in the lead again as we approached town, and I was on the armored platoon leader's tank, which was third in line. The point tank stopped about 100 yards ahead, halting the whole column, and in the lull we immediately heard German voices jabbering away, apparently excited at seeing American tanks six miles behind what they thought were their front lines. Their chatter came in clearly, even above the noise of our idling tank motors. I was now able to spot their voices at no more than ten feet from the right side of our tank, and I knew we had only a moment. I threw a hand grenade and at the same time yelled at Sergeant Williams just behind me on the tank to shoot his rifle grenade. Just a second later, the Germans let go with the Panzerfaust, and I think our firing first may have upset their aim, for they missed the broad side of the tank where we were sitting, and instead hit solid front armor about three feet to my left. The armor-piercing shell of the Panzerfaust exploded, but the angle was wrong for penetrating the armor. Nevertheless, it left huge cat-like claw marks across the front of the tank, some almost two inches deep and very jagged. My hand nearest, the blast stung sharply, and turned out to be burned. I can't help believing that if we hadn't gotten off our grenade so quickly, the German aim might have been truer, and our tank would have blown up and taken the rest of us with it. But the tank commander inside our buttoned-up tank evidently wanted no more of that spot, for suddenly we took off at full speed, jerking ahead so fast that some of us nearly lost what were, at best, very precarious seats. At that moment, our fourth tank, just behind us, was hit by a Panzerfaust and burst into flames. I had no hope at all for any of the men, the five crew members inside and all of my eight men riding the back. I really don't know their fate. I never saw any of them again. Now we had a new problem. Previously, the darkness had been some protection, but the flames of the burning tank lit up our road as brilliantly as a high school football field on a Friday night. 
We felt as though we were suddenly naked on Main Street. Our three lead tanks now were bunched up about 200 yards past the burning tank and some 300 yards short of Lemesnil Herman. My men and I piled off and took cover in the small ditches by the road. The hedges were not very close to the road there, and that was something of a good break because Panzerfaust teams couldn't get quite so close. The only way I could communicate with the tank platoon leader was through a field phone we'd rigged up on the back of his tank, and I used it now to talk over our awkward situation. We decided to radio the CO for instructions, since it didn't seem sensible to try to go on into Le Mesnil Herman with only three tanks and 24 riflemen. The tank lieutenant had been in the fighting in North Africa and Sicily, and since it was my first day in combat, I asked his opinion on what to do with my men. He suggested I spread them out a little more to make sure the Germans didn't get too close with a Panzerfaust. Our radio instructions seemed slow coming in, and we waited nervously in the bright light for minutes that seemed to drag into hours. At last we got word simply to turn around and rejoin the main body of the task force, now in a field about a quarter mile back. Great, but how? The tanks had to stick to the road, brightly lighted though it was, and that sure didn't look very attractive to me. But I couldn't see any other way out. The tank lieutenant suggested I keep my men spread out while they turned the tanks around in the road. This done, I asked what next. Well, he said, it looks like the only way out is to make a fast break for it. Then should I get my men mounted back on the tanks as fast as I can? I asked. Hell no, he snapped. They'll shoot your men off like flies. Without another word, all three tanks took off so fast the phone on the command tank was jerked from my hand, and we were left standing in the road with our mouths open. I was furious, but I knew I couldn't waste time on anger. Something had to be done, and fast. Some of my men were on the edge of panic. One was crying, and I noticed a few others were trembling. I didn't particularly blame them. We were surrounded by Germans who could see us plainly and soon should move in on us. We couldn't even call for help because our radio man had left his radio on one of the tanks. We were completely on our own. As the tanks had charged away, one of my men had run after it, trying to grab on from the rear. His feet bounced a couple of times in the road, and then he had to let go because of the extremely hot exhaust, so he was stuck with the rest of us. The Germans shot Panzerfausts at each tank as it passed the one still on fire, but they missed every time. The tanks thus had been lucky enough to get through. Now it was our turn to run the gauntlet. The instructors back at Fort Benning had never told me what to do in a situation like this, so I probably did everything wrong. I did remember one of their morsels of general advice, however. When in doubt, get off your butt and do something. It might take the enemy by surprise. I quickly got the sergeants together and told them that my simple plan was to make a break right down the road past the burning tank, fighting all the way. One thing in our favor was that I'd made each man carry four hand grenades instead of the usual two, my first hunch. My orders were to move out in single files on either side of the road with the men ten yards apart and no two abreast, to avoid bunching. Each man was to have a grenade in hand to be thrown over the hedgerow on my command. After getting rid of the first grenade, they were to run like hell. While they ran, they were to keep throwing grenades as often as possible, but to be sure to keep on running. When they were out of grenades, they were to fire their rifles at the top of the hedges while they ran. When rifles were empty, the orders were to keep on running without stopping to reload. Grimly and without a word, the sergeants moved off and quietly lined up the men. In a few moments, we headed for the burning tank. Platoon Sergeant Reed took the lead on the right, and I took it on the left, since I already knew where the German Panzerfaust team was on that side. The other sergeants brought up the rear. On my side of the road, there was no hedgerow for some 75 yards until we came to the corner of a field. As we walked toward this hedge, I carefully pulled the pin from my grenade, just in case it was needed quickly. When I had walked only a few yards, which seemed miles, beyond the hedgerow corner in the glaring light, I heard German voices just over the hedge. Evidently, they were excited about seeing American infantry walking openly down their road. I instantly threw my grenade. The Germans yelled, Grenade! Grenade! And I could hear them scrambling for cover. I then yelled, Let's go! At my men. And we broke the world's record for the 440.
Somehow I threw my other grenades and emptied my rifle as we tore along the road. The Jerry's fired machine guns and tossed grenades into the road. One grenade landed about three feet from me, but I was long gone when it went off. When we passed our burning tank, we were too scared of enemy action to worry about any of its shells going off. It was very hot and bright, almost incandescent, and smelled of burned flesh. A couple of dead GIs lay by the road, but we couldn't help them, so we kept on pounding down the road like a bunch of berserk Indians, firing all the while. Suddenly we came upon the poor GI on guard in the road for our main body, and he just stood there transfixed, as though he'd seen a ghost. He couldn't even open his mouth to challenge us. I checked my 24 men and all had made it, though two were slightly wounded. We had been miraculously lucky. It was now about 3 a.m., and my longest day finally was over. We dug slit trenches just deep enough to get our bodies below the surface of the ground, then tried to get some sleep. Though I was totally exhausted, my mind was much too wound up to relax in sleep. The tragedies and excitement of the day kept racing through my mind over and over. Also, the Germans were famous for counterattacks, and I didn't know at what moment they might come. I knew two of my men had been killed and two others wounded, and I could only assume the eight riding the blazing tank had been killed. I hoped some of them might have escaped, but I didn't see how. I certainly did not consider myself any sort of hero in any of this action, but my men thought otherwise. They wrote me up for a silver star, for gallantry in action above and beyond the call of duty. It was duly approved and later presented to me in person by our division commander, Major General Barton. Thoughts of a medal had never occurred to me, though I did appreciate it once it was awarded. My thoughts during the action were very rudimentary. How in hell do we get out of this mess? As it turned out, all we needed was speedy action and a tremendous amount of good luck. Speaking of luck, I had indeed been very lucky to survive my first day of combat. In the tank shootout at St. Gillis, if the Germans had knocked out our tank, I'm sure they would have turned machine guns on me and at 30 to 40 yards would have mowed me down. Again, when the Germans hit our tank with the Panzerfaust, just a foot to the left would have knocked out the tank and me with it. My rabbit's foot worked great that day. Day 2 of the saint lô Perrier Breakthrough the few remaining hours of darkness passed uneventfully in the task force bivouac, a large field a half-mile north of Le Mesnil Hermann. Few of us settled our nerves enough to sleep, and the cold, damp earth of our slit trenches had not eased our muscles. At first light we were told to get ready to move out again. The orders were inevitable, but the part that galled me was that my platoon was to lead the attack again. Customarily. Each of the three rifle platoons in the company took turns up front, which was only fair. Captain Holcomb explained it was the battalion commander himself who insisted my platoon lead again, since we had been the last ones in contact with the enemy, and therefore knew his location better than anyone else. I still felt misused, but didn't trust myself to say anything. We struggled off in the attack after hastily jamming down a cold K-ration breakfast. This time, as we headed for Le Mesnil Hermann, we at least could see where we were going and didn't have to stick to the road. The tanks cut straight across the hedgerows behind which the Germans had been the night before. Rifles and machine guns opened up on us at once with an angry clatter. My men ran over the rough field as fast as they could to get behind the tanks, and they fired their rifles back at the hedgerows whenever possible. They panted for breath, and their faces were flushed. Each tank had two machine guns and one 75mm cannon, and they let go with all weapons blasting away as they drove ahead. The enemy were so well pinned down they didn't even lift up enough to fire their Panzerfausts at our tanks. Soon our combined firepower was too much for them, and they began to wave white handkerchiefs. I learned later that over 200 prisoners had been taken in this attack, and I'm sure glad I hadn't known there were that many of them around. Some of them, I think, must have come from beyond the small fields we fought in. <laughs> the Germans usually were very good at taking care of their dead and wounded. After burials, they stuck a bayonet on the man's rifle and jammed the rifle in the ground at the head of the grave, with the soldier's dog tags hanging on the stock and his helmet on top of the butt. We did pass about ten new graves, obviously dug during the night, and this must have been the toll of our grenades. 
There was no way of knowing, of course, how many additional might have been wounded. As we continued forward, a frightful, almost inhuman scream came from the hedgerow close by on my left. I jumped through and found a wounded German bellowing in terror. He lay in the cart trail that ran down the middle of the hedgerow, and he was right in the path of one of our tanks. The tank was buttoned up, and the driver probably couldn't even look down to the road through his vision slits. I instinctively jumped in front of the tank, waved it to a halt, and dragged the wounded man to the side. His eyes showed me gratitude far better than words, for I wouldn't have understood words anyway. I couldn't help wondering whether a German would have helped me the same way, but somehow a helpless wounded man didn't seem like an enemy. As we finally came to the first buildings on the edge of Le Mesnil Hermann, we began to pick up some sniper fire and had to hit the ground and then run from cover to cover. We moved quickly from house to house and found that most of the enemy had fled. As we crossed one street, my radio man was shot by a sniper hiding in the upper floor over a store. I had crossed the road myself running hard, with the radio man following. It seems he had dropped a K-ration box, roughly the size of a carton of cigarettes, in the street and stupidly went back to pick it up. When he bent down to pick it up, the sniper got him. Our platoon medic rushed out to pull the radio man back, but he was already dead. Before the medic could run back, the sniper shot him in the side, even though he wore on chest and back the big red cross on white background that is supposed to give immunity. The medic was able to drag himself back to shelter, where he calmly dressed his own wound and stayed in action. He would have evacuated a rifleman with a similar wound, but he knew how badly he himself was needed. To my mind, the medics were the unsung heroes of the war. Their duty was so routinely hazardous that it was hard to tell when they went beyond its call. Most important was their deep effect on morale. We just knew that if we ever got hit, a medic would come out to get us, no matter where or when. Later, when we were able to reach the radio man, we found he had stuffed his pockets, his shirt, and even his oversized leggings with boxes of K rations. He had lost his life over a box of barely palatable survival food. Now we had three men definitely killed, and each was unnecessary. The man who stood up in the open and fired at an armored half-track, the one buried by our tank, and the chowhound. Sergeant Williams also was wounded in this action, but he was a very unusual case. A mortar shell had exploded near him, and even though the medic could not find a scratch on him, he was paralyzed from the neck down. He could move nothing but his eyes. This same Sergeant Williams had taken a bullet through the neck around D-Day and returned to the front in six weeks. He had a very heavy, bull-like neck, but it seemed to me he had returned too quickly after such a severe wound. He was an exceedingly stubborn individual, for he recovered from his second injury and returned to action in September. Then he was too close to a German grenade and was paralyzed a second time. After his subsequent recovery, he again applied for frontline action but was finally turned down. Some guys really did take a lot of punishment and had the starch to come back willingly for more. After going through the few remaining buildings in Le Mesnil Herman, I was ordered to take my platoon around to the left side of town and clear out a pocket of Jerry's in an apple orchard. Along with some tanks, we made our way to the first hedgerow on the edge of the apple orchard, about 200 yards beyond the northeast corner of town. These tanks were from the 66th Regiment of the 2nd Armored Division and we had trained together as a team for breaking through hedgerows. Our practice was for the tanks to fire all out at the hedgerow as they advanced, and when they got close enough they would raise their fire, and my platoon would duck under, rush in, and toss grenades over the hedge at any krauts waiting to ambush the tank. This was the way our attack on the apple orchard began, but for some unknown reason the lead tank didn't wait for our grenades, but plowed right on through the hedgerow. As the tank tilted upward on a small crest of dirt, it had plowed ahead. The waiting Germans hit it with a panzerfaust in the underbelly. The tank immediately burst into flames, but continued to roll on for about 30 yards until it stopped against an apple tree. It was the second of our 17 tanks to be knocked out by panzerfaust near Le Mesnil Hermann. The sergeant in command of the tank climbed out of the turret and, with 45 pistol in hand and bleeding from his nose and ears, he charged back at the hole his tank had made in the hedge, 
and captured the six Germans who had ambushed him and who were by then waiting for the rest of us to come through. Without pause, the sergeant then asked for help to get his wounded crew out of the tank. Several of us rushed right out and got two of the crew out. But it was now too hot to go in for the driver and assistant driver. They both were dead anyway, the sergeant said. After dragging the two wounded tankers back to our side of the hedge, we yelled for a medic, and the wounded medic himself came up to help. He immediately asked for an ambulance, and so the tank captain got on his radio. One of his half-track ambulances soon arrived and drove right out to the hedge where the wounded lay. At this point, the rest of us were ordered to fall back 100 yards to another orchard and take cover with the remaining tanks. The captain thought we were too much of a target and would attract shelling up where we were. So we watched from a distance as the ambulance driver and the crippled medic tried to load the wounded tank men onto stretchers and then into the ambulance. The painful wound in the side prevented our heroic medic from bending much or lifting. He couldn't help the driver, and so they had to call out for aid. The tank captain asked for volunteers, and four of my riflemen went right out. The four of them worked as a team and quickly loaded the first wounded man into the ambulance. They were grouped around the next man about to lift his stretcher when a mortar shell, which came down vertically without a sound, exploded with a bright flash and sharp crack right on the stretcher. The wounded man was blown to bits. He never knew a thing. Our four volunteers were all hit badly, though they did manage to struggle aboard the ambulance with the driver's help. Our medic was killed. Later, when I got the chance, I rode up the tank sergeant for a silver star and requested a posthumous one for the valiant medic. My four wounded volunteers were each put in for a bronze star. It seemed so terribly little to do for them. I happened to exchange glances with the tank captain, a really huge man, and then quickly looked away. He was crying. My own emotions weren't any too strong. It sure was tough to lose good men, and you never can get used to it. After the ambulance pulled away, we went right on through the apple orchard and by this time found no more enemy troops. On the way back, we heard a moan coming from one of the farmhouses near the edge of town and found a badly wounded young German soldier lying on a pile of blood-soaked bedding in the middle of the bare floor. It seems one of our planes had strafed his unit the day before and a 50 caliber machine gun bullet had entered the top of his right shoulder and gone out under his arm after puncturing a lung. Air sucked through a large hole in his side each time he took a breath. Judging from the amount of blood caked on the bedding and on him, I didn't see how he could still be alive. I covered his wounds to try to stop the air from sucking in too much dirt, and our ambulance team took him to the rear. They thought he would pull through, but I never heard any more about him. We hoped our wounded might get the same kind of humane treatment from the Germans. With Lemesnil Herman secure, we dug in for the night along the road on the southeast side of town. The Germans were watching us, of course, the whole time, and we soon received some very concentrated shelling. This was my personal introduction to the famous German 80 pm artillery piece. The shells traveled faster than sound, hitting the ground all around us before we heard their incoming whistle. This time we were very lucky simply because a great many shells did not explode. Later we learned the French resistance had been sabotaging 80D millimeter shells. I counted eight duds sticking in the ground within 30 yards of my foxhole. So thank you, Mr. Frenchman. That night, as usual, I went around a couple of times to check my men and found one asleep on guard. When on the actual front, we always kept half the men on guard at all time, following the buddy system, one man on guard while his buddy slept. I really gave the soldier hell trying my best to scare the life out of him. He assured and reassured me it never would happen again, so I let him off. Perhaps some may say I should have court-martialed him, but we all were on our last legs, and I felt he deserved another chance. As it turned out, he later proved himself a good soldier, a man I could always count upon. As my second day of combat came to a close, I found my casualty list very high. Of my original forty men, three had been killed in my presence and fifteen others were wounded, although this last was optimistic in that it included the eight men on the burning tank. Totally exhausted by two endless days of fighting, I quickly fell asleep in the shallow foxhole I had managed to scoop out. It was about eighteen inches deep and barely wide enough and long enough to lie in.
The ground was hard and damp, and we didn't have a blanket, so we just lay down with our clothes on and used our helmets for pillows. Only a man completely done in could manage to sleep like that. Our combat fatigues were chemically impregnated to keep out enemy gas, but they also kept in all the July heat and body odors. Fortunately, we were in the open air and rather busy, for we were becoming a bit fragrant. It was a good thirty days before we got a change of clothes, and what a relief. The Army engineers set up hot showers in the open fields, and they were really great, but they never had them very close to the front. Now, at the end of the second day of a great drive, we were a solid six miles deep into enemy territory. We had no idea what units behind us might be doing, but our great hope was that General Patton's army might have started through the gap we had opened. 